Welcome to everybody, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I'm very pleased to say we've got 116 participants so far, which is fantastic. So, to summarise, to start with, I mean, I've known Hugh for 35, 40 years. Um, we've both been members of the Falkland Island Study Group for that time, that's where we met. We've been to the Falklands together with Ronnie Spafford in the 2003-04 uh, season. Um, Q has always had a passion for South Georgia, as long as I can ever remember. I mean, he collects other things in Falkland Islands, but South Georgia has always been very special. And as I always think it's important, personally, that people talk about something that they know about, they've researched and they've been to and he has been so there we are that's as i hope is a very good introduction to our speaker who is very very enthusiastic about this hugh over to you thank you mike and i i wish good afternoon to you all i'm going to talk about the postal history of south georgia we start with a few bits of information. I'm going to explain that there were three key facts that led to the creation of the southern whaling industry on South Georgia. Firstly, it was the enthusiasm and determination of a Norwegian sea captain by the name of Carl Anton Larsen, who was in effect the founder uh, and it was he who had the drive to establish modern whaling on South Georgia. It was the invention of the explosive harpoon that made whaling possible in Antarctic waters, and that was by another Norwegian called Sven Foyn. And finally, the demand the whaling industry supplied oil that was used throughout the world in foodstuffs, cosmetics, and in the production of nitroglycerine, which was a significant factor that kept the Gritviken whaling station open in World War I. Okay, I, I, I move on now to the second slide. Um, with a bit of a, sh a short history lesson, to um, explain how things developed and why uh, it all took place. It starts with going back to olden times. And on those days when the sun had set, how did we make light? We had candles, of course, but we also burnt oil in lamps. Remember, I'm speaking of times before crude oil was extracted from the ground and refined to produce the light oils. Then. Oil was an animal product made by boiling the blubber found under the skin of whales and seals. And therein lies the crucial factor of what drove sealing. James Cook landed on South Georgia, which you can see before you, on the 17th of January in 1772. It was his reports of an abundance of seals that enticed sealers, particularly from the eastern sea coast of USA into the southern oceans. And so began the first era of southern whaling. Overfishing and the due natural recovery afterwards explained why there were periods of famine and feast. And perhaps it was 50 years of, of famine before the next feast. Sealing was practiced at South Georgia long before, but later in parallel with whaling. South Georgia is an island, as we have seen, located deep in the South Atlantic Ocean, but it is technically outside of Antarctica. It is, re it is remote, not close to any shipping route. It is cold, it has frequent stormy periods with rough seas. The northern coast provides some shelter to shipping and has a number of natural harbours, as you can see. As we have said, 
we are thought the uh, South Georgia is about uh, a thousand miles away from uh, the Falkland Islands, where the governor uh, there was in charge of South Georgia. And significantly from a male point of view, it was another loosely thousand miles to Montevideo, which was a key mail hub to which the Falklands and South Georgias was, were connected to get mail up to London and from London across the world. All seven stations that were opened on South Georgia listed here are marked variously around where they are on the island. And as you will see, they are all on the northern side because on the southern, there are no safe places to anchor. I would just draw your attention at this point to this bay, King Harkon Bay, because we will explain a journey that was taken from there to Stromness by Ernest Shackleton. And lastly, I'll end by just pointing out that Gritfeken comes from two Swedish words, <clears throat> grit meaning a pot and viken a cove. It was the pots that the early sealers used to render the blubber down to produce oil. As I've said, um, we have seven whaling stations. They're listed here in a little bit more detail. The first, Carl <coughs> um, Anton Larsen's, was Pesca at Gritviken. The first mail that I can find is this entire. It goes back to 1841, some 60 years before Carl Anton Larsen developed whaling. And it is a report from a son to father on board a son on board an expedition ship going whaling, uh, sailing in South Georgia and finding nothing. He is critical of the captain in the letter. The letter, we presume, was transferred at sea and found its way on this ship to New York to, to, to be delivered, uh, as we've explained at Stonington on the eastern sea coast of, South, uh, of the United States. Another early piece of mail. It's from the very first expedition that uh, took, uh, took place on South Georgia, 1883, 1882, 1883, as part of the first international polar year. It was a successful German venture. They were delivered to and collected from South Georgia by the Imperial German Navy of the time. And on the way home, they were taken to Montevideo, where this was the first opportunity the expedition had of sending an email for a year. And here is a letter card, uh, Uruguayan letter card, with its stamp here, sent to Germany. An odd feat of, of the expedition to just pass uh, a comment on is that whilst they were there at uh, South Georgia, Krakatoa, the um, volcano exploded and they were able to detect a, a measurable difference in sea level as a consequence of the explosion and waves that followed. We move on now to the first postcard that we can establish that was actually written on South Georgia or to be a little bit more accurate, in the coastal waters of South Georgia. By now, Carl Anton Larsen had ceased whaling in Norwegian waters because of the scarcity of whales and had accepted the opportunity to be the captain of the Swedish polar expeditionary ship that went down to Antarctica. At this point, he is on his way back from Antarctica, intending to go to the Falkland Islands and stops to take some seven weeks on South Georgia. And here we see him camped there close to Gritviken. It was there 
that he formed his personal uh, ambition to establish a whaling station on South Georgia. So what did that mean to establish uh, a whaling station to South Georgia? It was a considerable undertaking. It required him to, fight, to use some three ships on which he uh, shipped everything that was necessary for the whaling station, the materials, the labor, the housing, the machinery to keep the other machinery going. And he landed in late 1904, producing the first refined whale oil on Christmas day that year. He took his family. And these are two postcards um, sent uh, in 1905, very early, 1907, a couple of years later, to Sini, one of his daughters on South Georgia. Quite exceptional. This one is overrated because it is assumed that the second tenure stamp is to pay for the costs of mailing the postcard from, from Buenos Aires to Gritviken. Not necessary, it was taken by a pesca catcher on its return journey, returning to South Georgia. The other one, a couple of years later, has this large A, which has been put on by the post office there to indicate which dock the catcher was, such they could deliver a postcard to the catcher for its journey to South Georgia. The last two items I talked about were inward mail to South Georgia in its early days. This is an example of outgoing mail in 1909. It predates the post office and, and is um, sent by uh, courtesy on a pesca catcher on its way to Buenos Aires where it was posted. Very few known to show this particular way of getting mail off South Georgia. We will talk again about this young Jao Stoker from Norway and his season whaling on South Georgia. At this point, perhaps I should say something about how the whaling stations operated, particularly from a point of view of labor. Stations operated annually, each year being sourced from a ship expedition equipped to go whaling for the duration of the southern whaling season. And the ship was set out fully equipped with fuel and all that was needed from Sandefjord in southern Norway. The group of ships would comprise catchers, transport tanker ships and on the journey south, taking the fuel oil or coal and on the way back, taking the refined oil and possibly floating factory ships in the case where there was no um, whaling station yet built on land and all the activity of doing the refining took place on a ship anchored close in offshore. That expedition had to take, and I keep saying this, everything, because there was nothing available, neither labor nor resources on South Georgia. And prior to the arrival of Carl Larson was uninhabited. Small teams overwintered to undertake plant and catcher maintenance. The numbers were small and they would probably do two year contract to be able to do so. They would arrive on and South Georgia sometime October and later and depart beginning April the next year. And in that time would complete a season, which was typically from March or December to March, but could be shorter dependent on the sea conditions and ice conditions. I'm now going to talk about this man on the right, James Innes Wilson. He was 
the first appointed administrator, magistrate, postmaster, and a number of other uh, appointments, all in the one man on South Georgia. He arrived in November 1909. He opened the post office at the beginning of December. And um, by the end of the month, he shipped the first mail out. There were four date stamps. Uh, and this is uh, an example of the first day of that first date stamp, as we can see here, unnecessarily supplemented by this South Georgia hand stamp, which by then had become unnecessary, but it is unique. The first example of registered mail, again, a service introduced by JIW, and this is from the first um, mail the 7th, I think, if I remember correctly. No, sorry, uh, yeah, the 7th. Um, and there were just 39 registered items in that mail, and only two are known to have survived. One of my favorites of my collection, um, it, it's an inward piece. It's from, as you can see, the Times Book Club of London, and it is addressed to Hans Wold, who was the personal secretary of Carl Anton Larson. The British stamp, as you can see here, we, the rate is explained, um, is not very obvious, but there it is. One of the more fascinating pieces of my ex exhibit. We spoke earlier of this guy who was a stoker um, and his correspondence came to light quite recently in Norway, some nine or 10 pieces um, and I have a couple. This one went through the post from Pusvik where he was working to Norway in a different way. It was closed in an envelope. So we say it was sent undercover. It is probable that he made that decision because it was sent on the second mail in 1910. Um, and we suspect he did not know that he could buy stamps and all the rest of that at that time because of the difficulty of communication within South Georgia. There was no postal delivery, no email, no telephones, and he was some miles distant away working on board ship. So the chances of him being kept up to date with the develops in mail were remote. South Georgia wasn't the only place that whaling took place in the Falkland and South Georgia area. For a short while, a whaling station was established on New Island, which is an island within the archipelago of the Falkland Islands, but it was not a, a successful venture and was shut down in 1917, having been opened some seven years. Quite extraordinary to find mail from uh, New Island. It is difficult to find mail from early South Georgia, but to find one piece of mail between these two destinations, quite exceptional. It's to a friend that uh, any um, collector of this era will know, Edward Binney, here he is um, on uh, South Georgia. He had taken over from James Wilson for a period of time, whilst James Wilson went home to Scotland on leave, which he would take periodically accumulating one or two years of leave to be able to travel to Europe and back. This is mail from the third station that I present in this, um, in this presentation. As we can see, it's from Stromness. 
And there is quite a wonderful amount of research that you can do in the Sandefjord Museum if you live locally. And I have a very long-standing friend, Odd from uh, Sandefjord, who does things for me. And he was able to find this company record, which if we look down here, you might be able to see is uh, Emmanuel Everardson, the writer of this cover to his wife, Sophie, at home. And we know what he did. He was a pressure cooker operator from 1928 to 1931. We actually know he was a long-term whaler because we will come back to this particular individual at a later date in this presentation. Ah, yes, a, a very interesting card, this one. As you can see, it is addressed to Germany. Germany wanted to have its share of the southern whaling boom, then very much just an Anglo-Norwegian affair. The sender of this item we know to be one Kirchis. Um, and we now know, and I will show you later, he was not the only German active on South Georgia in these times. But in view of what uh, this particular man gets up to, which I explain here, you have to begin to wonder whether his, as I politely call it, tour was not in fact industrial espionage. We shall never know. By 1935-36, when the Germans um, started whaling, they whaled pelagically. That means they did not have a whaling station on land, they had the whaling station on board ship. That ship had to provide everything, all the services, all the water, all the capacity to store the processed whaling oil, typically going into the same tanks that had been emptied of the fuel oil, which they required, cleaning the tanks in between. And it began, this pelagic whaling was one of the reasons why no further land stations were established. The other key factor, which you can see at the back end of this ship, there was a slipway up the rear end of the ship here, and you can see it goes down to the water. And whales were no longer flinched, flinched very dangerously on the side of the ship by holding the whale to the side of the ship and cutting the blubber off. They were dragged up this ramp inside the center of the ship and flensed on board. And the combination of all these developments made pelagic whaling a possibility. And in the end, it was very financially rewarding because the key factor was that there were no government controls that they had to recognize, no government taxation, no restriction, no licenses, and very profitable. There were seven whaling stations I mentioned, and this is the fourth station, Godthal. Um, for many years, no male from Godthal had survived. But in the last 10 years, uh, a correspondence entered the market. Uh, and this is from that correspondence. Uh, this is the only known correspondence of anybody associated with Godthal. Um, and uh, as you can see, it just says South Georgia. But the records have established where uh, the sender, as I've said here, worked. And we know it was Godthal. A nice item that opened up. Uh, another of the whaling station mail. Number five was called New Fortuna Bay. As you can see here now, uh, a modern picture. Uh, it changed uh, its name, New, For New, New Fortuna Bay, to Ocean Harbour after the uh, whaling station closed. It was one of the first to close. Um, a nice piece, difficult to find some of these. Aha, 
we're now going to introduce the subject of the German South Polar Expedition, which in 1911, you'll see I'm saying 12 here, in 1911 had visited South Georgia and caused a bit of chaos in the postal administration by demanding more stamps than could be provided and a hand stamp had to be used to allow postage to continue. Some 56 of the items of these are known, but this is a rarer uh, piece of German South Polar expeditionary history. This, car this card comes when the ship had been to Antarctica and returned, and on the return visit, found it necessary to go back into Gritviken. Why? Well, by then, as you might find or would not be surprised to hear, the, um, there's an unhappy ship on board. The crew was split in loyalty, some to the expedition leader and some to, uh, in particular, the ship's captain who had died in uh, August whilst down in Antarctica. And the new ship's captain who sent this card um, was also no friend of the leader, Wilhelm Filchner. Conditions on board um, didn't actually break down, but Filchner was concerned that the, he would have trouble when he returned to South Georgia and thought it necessary to seek uh, help from Binney, who had um, the ability to provide some additional muscle to him to keep conditions cool on board. This young captain was sacked, uh, disembarked forcibly, but he wrote to his family to record that he had arrived on South Georgia quite safe. Hmm, something of an understatement perhaps, but that's what he did. There were many expeditions that used the courtesy and kindness of the South Georgia whaling enterprises, not least um, Eric, Ernest Shackleton and his famous Imperial Transantarctic Expedition of 1914. This card, as you can see on the right, um, with the message written upside down, so as to speak, is from Len. Um, Len Hussey, and he's written to his parents, posted at the last possible moment before the ship set off south to the ice and into expeditionary history. The next is also um, another piece of mail associated with this expedition. It is addressed to this gentleman here, Thomas McLeod, who was one of the more experienced able seamen of the Endurance, who uh, survived, as we all know, the sinking of the ship and um, ended up on Elephant Island. And this picture here shows how emaciated he was when he was rescued. His weight had dropped from one, 200 to 100 pounds. This was a cover with a message from his family waiting for him on South Georgia. But they did not treat this male waiting for the return of the expedition properly because they all feared that it would never be collected. The map, why have I put the map here? Because this gives you something of the uh, appreciation of how harsh it was for Shackleton to cross South Georgia to seek the help for his expedition. He lands, now we were talking very earlier on about the southern side of South Georgia having no safe anchorages, but he finds his way by good fortune into this bay and anchors at the top end, leaving two of his crew behind because one was unwell and set off to cross, cross South Georgia something that had never been done before. And this was his route. And this is where he wanted to get to, or this is where he did get to. I don't think he minded which 
whaling station he found, but it was Stromness that he did. He was very lucky. He was getting tired. He was um, Ill, Ill equipped, ill prepared, undernourished for this arduous effort, and was somewhere round about where I'm pointing when he heard a siren. And he knew instantly that his wishes to get to safety would be satisfied because that was the siren of the whaling station calling the men to work at the beginning of the day. And as we know, he made it there and eventually collected his expeditionary members left in Antarctica. Okay, we move on to another expedition some 12 years later. It's a, it's a German meteor expedition, here's the vessel. And they mapped the seabed of the South Atlantic to the benefit of, uh, of all future mariners. And they did this by crisscrossing the South Atlantic on a number of voyages, some 14. And on the 5th, they set out from, they set out to go from South Shetlands, SS South Shetlands to Cape Town. And one of the crew wrote this letter home to Germany and posted it um, at South Shetlands, which are this, these councils here. The mail facilities on uh, um, the South Shetlands were very limited. So the ship took the mail with him to take it to South Georgia, where this second one was written again to Germany. And the two then were taken to Montevideo to find their way north. A nice pairing of items from a very limited mail from the expedition. A different kind of expedition, this one in 1931. It is the, from the um, steamship Anglo Norse floating factory ship on a pelagic uh, whaling expedition which used an off-duty catcher to take the mail into South Georgia and then uh, found its way to Stanley, to the brother of Edward Binney that we have often mentioned earlier before. We're getting up to date now, we're in 1938. You all have heard, I am sure, of HMS Exeter, a cruiser, um, that fought the Battle of the River Pate um, and was seriously damaged. In 1938, she paid a visit to the Falkland Islands and then went on to South Georgia, waving the flag, we might say today. And we have a lovely picture here of her in Gritbicken Bay. Here she is, the Shackleton's um, grave memorial in the foreground. By the date of the council, we know that this postcard, ironically addressed to Germany, was taken uh, to Stanley and then on um, into the international mail system, which eventually found its way to Germany. Unusually, I think this was applied, uh, I think in Newcastle, um, we know that by um, philatelic records. There is a rumor that South Georgia uh, hospitalized and helped some of the uh, injured crew from HMS Exeter, which we now know not to be the case. But we do know that a uh, steel plate was shipped from South Georgia to help patch up the Exeter to enable her to get back to the UK. My last expedition is one of 1943-45, Operation Tabarin. The War Cabinet Office in England decided that they needed to reinforce their presence in Antarctica because of ambitions of expansionism by Argentina and Chile and set up Operation Tabrin under Royal Naval leadership and in, by the end of the war had established four bases and, in Antarctica. A new set of stamps was introduced for South Georgia, this, these with overprints, and were delivered by Fitzroy, which was the um, supply ship at that time for Operation Tabarin on loan from the Falkland Island Company. 
for political reasons, these covers, one to London, one to Uruguay, eventually found their way to London because at that time, a demonstration of territorial ownership was having an operating post office. That's why these two were sent from South Georgia to reinforce the South Georgia claim. I'm now moving into a section of censorship. We mentioned earlier another German whaler. Here's another one, Otto Krall. Um, and there was serious correspondence, which this is an extract from, that I found in researching down in Falkland Islands, talking about World War I handling of the mail from non-British, non-Norwegian whalers, and how it would be censored um, during World War I. This is the only known censored mail from South Georgia of World War I, which was censored on South Georgia. We know that it came, as I said, from Otto Krall, and he got involved like the earlier German with the German whaling industry, um, and he managed their first whaling expedition in 1936, a nice item. Mail would be censored from South Georgia at London. Um, and here we have an example. Um, this is the uh, written by one of the catchers serving this floating factory ship, the Nico of the um, uh, La uh, Salverson fleet, registered in London on its way to USA. Unusual. Argentine politics, you wouldn't expect me to have a presentation without going into this topic, and I do. Um, by 1933, um, the history of uh, relationship between Falkland Islands, South Georgia, and Argentina was complex and acrimonious, particularly in 1933, because the Argentines did not accept this issue of stamps that celebrated 100 years of British administration on South Georgia, uh, on the Falkland Islands and on South Georgia. They treated the um, issue as invalid, charged postage due, as we can see here, um, and to find examples from South Georgia is difficult. 1940, um, an inter interesting piece of postal history um, sent by Edvardson, who we meant earlier, from this floating factory ship. This was the last season in 1940. The Germans uh, did a lot of damage to the whaling um, ships on the way back to Norway at the end of the season, and there were no further Norwegian um, whaling expeditions until after World War II. The ship was um, lost in the Atlantic in 1943. Germany, we talk about a bit of that country, and I need to point out this is a bit of an interloper because it is from the Falkland Islands, but it is addressed to Norway to a well known um, uh, whaling uh, agent, uh, strongly involved in getting the fleet ships uh, at the beginning of any season in making certain they had a full complement of labor. At this time, this particular cover had arrived in London shortly after Norway had been invaded, and it was therefore impossible to send it on to Norway. And so the instruction was put upon it, postal services suspended, return to sender. Few known, none from South Georgia. A nice item, very unusual in postal history to find a registered postcard. Here we have one um, sent as it turns by, turns out to be by the then company doctor of Pesca to France. Unusual. I won't say anything more. Chances of, I've never seen another. Ah, yes. 
Next group of three slides are all got a common story. I bought a book to um, expand my whaling library. And in that book, Ian Hart talked about this little office here, which was a photographic studio producing cards, would you believe it, on South Georgia um, at uh, the whaling station, Prince Oval Harbor. And here is the front of my postcard from that man. Thank you to Scott, to Stephen Palmer. We have that photograph of now considerably improved Adobe and all the skills that it takes. And that is the picture. This is on the postcard. And that is the picture that I went, uh, I took when I went there in 2006. And you can see much commonality. And here we have the postcard with a cache on it, which you can read. It doesn't say Prince Olav, it just says Prince. Um, very nice. Again, not seen another one. We have explained that South Georgia is remote. And to use modern parlance, it had supply issues running out of registered labels and stamps at various times. And these next couple of covers show um, the use of um, labels that were not intended to be used at South Georgia, but they made use of them. This one comes from New Ireland, which by then had shut down. Uh, and so they used it on to register mail from South Georgia. But in this case, they were naughty because they failed to delete New Ireland, which was a UPU regulation to make certain that the label correctly said where it had been registered. Unusual, few known. They also used labels from Stanley. This is the only example known. And perhaps to convince some of you just how long a time it takes to build a collection such as you have seen, I knew about this cover some 20 years ago, but I eventually found it in America after 20 years. As we've explained, supply issues ran out of stamps. They ran out of the low values, halfpenny, penny, tuppence, and they wanted to be able to put threepence on these, which would send the rate. And usually they decepted by setting a tuppenny, halfpenny to pay a halfpenny addition to make that threepence. In this case, they bisected a sixpenny. The one on the left is unique. The one on the right is one of two. Lovely items, both in effect unique to the philatelic market. In 1928, the well-known uh, iconic South Georgia provisional, um, some uh, 1,180 were produced. The vast majority on uh, philatelic covers, very few known, correctly used to Norway. Quite a nice gem, really, very rarely seen. And the marking here, where you can see 2.5D has been put to increase its rate from Tuppence to Tuppence Hapney, is held in our museum in London. And lastly, um, a later example in 1930, another Tupney stamp, stamp bisected to pay the penny postcard rate. Uh, one of two known, um, very difficult to find when you build a collection, but I did eventually find one. I hope I've entertained you. My presentation comes to an end. And uh, you can just see some of the background of why I uh, have developed this collection, what I know and who I've been. Mike kindly mentioned the first two or three. I'm also a trustee of the Falkland Island Museums and Archive, a UK charity. And I have written quite extensively. But time is up. So I say to you, thank you.
Now, at this point, I would say to people, let's ask Hugh some questions. However, I've been monitoring the chat. We have no questions in the chat. Well done, mate. <laughs> so that they've let you off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So seriously, if no one's got any questions, then we clearly can't ask you any. No, you cannot. Well, you can, you can invent them, but... Um... <laughs> yeah. I was interested in the amount of registered mail that was being sent out from such a small place, but I presume that was probably people sending wages or money back to home, is that right? We think so. Um, most of the registered mail seems to be not to Norway. That um, we have records that show us that registered mail went to Norway, and I suspect for the very reasons you've um, suggested, the money was extracted with pleasure. Um, the, the humble thing called the letter that um, envelope in which it had been binned, not of any value. What was in it was what they wanted. No. Thank you. Has anyone else got any questions for Hugh? I'll ask a, a quick supplementary of, question. Of course you can, Ian. Yeah. Are, are, there, are there any AR covers? Any pardon? AR covers. Oh, um, one with... Um, no, I, I have not seen one. They're rare generally, but uh, I just wonder whether, bearing I, in I, mind... It, if you could offer me one, you might. Um, we might talk business, but no, I have never seen one. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mark Brian here. I, I have Brian. a question. Of course, um, Brian. I was fascinated what you were saying about HMS Exeter and the damage it received, and that they managed to um, send steel plate from South Georgia. Where did they get their steel plate from? Was it from the whaling ships or? Yes. Um. You may have recalled that I explained that people overwintered and those people would undertake <laughs> plant and catcher maintenance. So if the, if the uh, catcher had damaged plate because it had bumped into something, maybe the mothership or the floating factory ship, who knows, then they had the facilities to dry dock the catcher, replace the um, offending parts and did so maintaining the catcher fleet for the next season. Their steel was modern, high quality, um, and very uh, useful to patch up some of the holes on um, HMS Exeter. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, what, what, I'm just interested what the non-whaling population of South Georgia at the time would have been. Um, well, it might have been family, if you like to call that non-whaling. Um, non Other than that, um, Everybody on the island was there uh, earning their living because um, that's why they were there. There were very few um, who weren't working earning their living. There were one or two senior wives perhaps with family, but in the main um, there, were, there was no other activity to make a life um, pleasant on uh, South Georgia. It was a work, dedicated work alcohol was forbidden, there was a museum, a uh, um, uh, cinema, you could perhaps go skiing at times, you could perhaps play football at times, but outside of that was no other interest. Well, it was a permanent population then as it were? Out of, uh, um, it, here, it rose to about four figures um, in, the, uh, in the best of times, and they all, the vast majority came from Norway as whalers, quite a lot from Britain uh, and elsewhere from Argentina for some of the labor. Um, but um, it was uh, an annual trip to South Georgia to go whaling. And you were there for the duration of the season. Um, there was no long-term uh, residencies there apart right. from a few of the officials. Okay. Again, can I just ask also, you mentioned with the, the ships, the, and there was a, a term used for it when the, when the, the factory ships, as it were, yeah. um, and you said they didn't need licences, was it just a free-for-all then? Or, uh... Well, we started off uh, having to 
use the land to whale. The key requirement then was copious amounts of water, which you needed to boil, render the mm. blubber to generate the oil. It had to be high quality, good water to get high quality, good oil. That meant you, you, you located your whaling station where there was plenty of fresh water, um, mm. maybe a glacier, lake or whatever, but that's what you needed to do. If you whale at sea, you have to take sea water, and as you know, you can uh, extract clean drinkable water from sea water, but you have to have a lot of it. fuel oil to boil it to, and then condense the steam. It was some time before they were able to compact and generate enough water to have a um, whaling ship operational, um, and that was one of the key drivers that enabled them to break out of South Georgia and therefore break away from any government restriction. Uh, uh, no taxes to pay. They, they chose where they went. Nobody could say no. It was done on the high seas. Thank you. It's very helpful. Thank you. Has anyone else got any questions for Hugh? No. OK. Mike, I would therefore suggest that that was the end of the question session. So back to you, sir. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you, Hugh. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, talk. Very interesting in a number of ways. Uh, you gave a great impression of the remoteness of the place. Somewhere I've never been, I'd like to go. Um, but it, you really did get the atmosphere of uh, how I imagine it would have been. Thank you very much for the, uh, the history, the map of the whaling station. So everybody's got a clear idea of what was involved, where they were. Um, you then went on to talk about some of the important ex expeditions and went into some detail of um, what went right and what went wrong. Uh, which was all good, very good stuff. Um, and you described what you, you said was the all-in man. In other words, somebody who was the postmaster, the magistrate, the receiver of wrecks, and a whole lot more. Yes. Um, which is something you and I saw in Ascension as well, I think. Yeah. Um, just to pick out one or two fantastic items, um, I agree with you completely about the book, the, the, uh, the book post label going in. I think that's fantastic. The New Ireland to South Georgia postcard, which was in somebody else's collection before yours and before me, it was with Stefan Hines, I think. Yes, yes. Um, so it's been around, but it's a lovely thing. And then we have the discovery of the Godthal correspondence um which when i was still collecting south georgia 15 years ago um we hadn't i think well at least i knew, knew nothing about it um and that is i think one of the most difficult of the stations to get hold of in terms of um uh, covers but you concentrated on what i would call proper commercial and, per and personal covers not not this philatelic rubbish yeah. and uh Fantastic for that, really good. So overall, wonderful, thank you very much. Lived up to my expectation. You might like to know, um, and Mark will probably take great <coughs> delight in telling me I'm wrong, but it, to me, you peaked at 130 people. So that's thank great. You. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to hand over to our president, who's going to present you with a virtual certificate. Thank you. Peter. Hello. Hello. Um, and a very, very good afternoon to all of you and particularly to Hugh. Some of you may not know that um, Hugh and I are related through um, wow. his sister and my brother's wife. And I had the great pleasure of seeing her this morning. And she sends her very best wishes and love to you. Thank you. Um, she will be watching 
uh, I think, on a recording of this because um, it's also my brother's birthday today and they have a birthday to yes. lots of grandchildren. Anyway, um, great show, very interesting indeed. I mean, one of the things that strikes me about this is that philately is such an engaging subject that it wants to take you to a place which is clearly extremely inclement and indeed for many many years there wasn't even any alcohol there no. so that really shows the 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 immense um effort that hugh has taken to complete his philatelic uh, knowledge of the south georgia and and the associated islands and i am personally extremely impressed some wonderful things and mike every word you said i endorse entirely. So it's my huge pleasure to present to you um, this certificate, which I have in my hand, but which Mark has got an electronic version of. So Mark, if you would kindly put it up, we can present it to Hugh. Thank you. Yes, that's very nice. Um, thank you very much. We shall be sending that obviously on in due course. Thank you. And. Um, Th thanks again. Um, it's a great show, some wonderful material, and I've no doubt at all that every one of the 130 uh, who watch today will come back again, perhaps, and others will too. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Yes, yeah, it'll go on the wall. Yes. Um, my wife, Mary, is next to me listening and, and enjoying it, but... Uh, Thank you all. I've, um, I've actually enjoyed it. Um, the presentation uh, takes quite a bit of work um, and you learn every time um, you undertake one of these. Very enjoyable. Yep. Okay, well, uh, I think that uh, concludes the formal procedure. Thank you very much.